Run it up, to run it back. Run it up, to run it back. Run it up, run it back. Good Wednesday morning. Welcome. This is FanDuel TV. This particular program is named Run It Back. My name is Michelle, and I'm joined by my friends, Stadium Insider, Sham Sharania, Chandler Parsons, Hat Day, and Lou Will there on the end. And gentlemen, coming to you from a very rainy, dreary New York City. And um, the vibes, however, much better this morning than they were perhaps before the game started last night. And that is where we start. A little Pacers Knicks, the garden. Woo! It's got that lead back, 3-2. Brunson, once again, that's a 121-91 total. He had 44 points. Uh, his fifth, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 40-point game this postseason. Barton Hartenstein with 28 rebounds combined. The entire Indiana team had 29. Pascal Siakam threw in his 22. But Jalen Brunson, say what you want. Right now, he's averaging a skosh under 34 points in the playoffs in a game. Uh, we can just do the playoff MVP right now. That's our little award we're going to give out. Where do you put him in that running, Chandler? It's it's hard not to put him number one. They're winning games. You know, the most impressive thing with him is his team is more banged up than any other team in the postseason. You look at the Bucs, you look at the Clippers, they lost key, key players, right? Pacers have guys like Benedict Mather. Everyone's gone through this. The Knicks have gone through this more than anybody. They've lost their absolute stud in Julius Randle. They're starting center in Mitchell Robinson. Their most versatile <laughs> player, OG. Their best shooter, Boyan Bogdanovich. They've they've lost. They keep losing critical pieces, and Jalen Brunson just keeps getting better. So it's not even about bigger opportunity or more role. He does this with them in the lineup. He does this without them in the lineup. He makes everyone around them better. When you watch the Knicks play. They just play harder. They cut harder. They move without the ball harder. They space the floor. And Jalen Brunson is wow. just a, he puts on just a master, master class of how to use his body, how to get in the paint. He hits ridiculously hard shots. So when you look at the, the landscape of the playoffs right now, the, the Knicks, everything they've been through, I, I would give the MVP to Jalen Brunson, just the, the adversity they've faced, the injuries, the inconsistencies. He's been so consistent. He's putting up historic numbers for the Knicks. Uh, so I don't think you can look at it. I mean, Jokic has been unbelievable. SGA has been unbelievable. Luke has been pretty good. But, man, Jalen Brunson's been better than everybody, in my opinion. What do you think, Lou? Yeah, I agree. Jalen is at the, he's at the top of the list when it comes to guys and how they've performed in this postseason. He's brought New York City basketball back. Um, I happen to follow a lot of New York Knicks fans that I didn't realize that I did, but they've been super <laughs> excited about what he's been. <laughs> yeah, they've been super excited about what he's been able to do to the morale of the city. And, it, and it's good for it's good for business when New York City is, is alive and well in a basketball world and, and they're competing. And Jalen Brunson is a big reason for that excitement, just the way that he's going about it. He's not talking any trash. They're dealing with injuries. They're dealing with all of these things. They're not making excuses. Every time something happens, every time somebody goes out, he takes his game to another level and he continues to lead this team. And so if we had to do it all over again, Jalen Brunson would never be the MVP of the playoffs right now. Lou, Lou, he's the fourth player ever to score 40 straight points in a playoff. Like, think about that. Ever. In the history of the NBA, no, it is amazing. unbelievable the numbers he's putting up. So, yeah, the lists Amazing. that he has jumped onto in the course of like this second half of the season, and especially the playoffs, it's pretty impressive. Um, but I guess not to everyone, Lou, because there are always going to be naysayers and they're always going to have negativity and put that in the air. And last night, that role went to Draymond Green, uh, who decided to call the Knicks a fluke. Uh, that's the hot word today. You're going to hear it a lot if you listen to anything about sports. Uh, Lou, what do you say to that? Uh, Dre tripping. He tripping. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you, you, I mean, you can't, you can't call them a fluke. If anything, they've been consistent. These guys have faced adversity. Um, they've been consistent, like I just mentioned. They have, um, they haven't made any excuses for themselves. They've dealt with injuries. They've dealt with uh, criticism coming from people saying that 
you know, maybe they're being overworked, maybe they're playing too many minutes, and they just keep trucking on and they win big game after big game. All games that they're supposed to win, they're there and they're winning in big time fashion. So for him to call him a fluke, I would like, I, I don't have context on what he said. I would like to understand the basis of why he would say that. But this New York Knicks team has been in the mix all year. They've been consistent. Now that the postseason has started, you know, they're one, one win away from getting to the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't know how that qualifies as a fluke. So I got Dre tripping on this one. Nice. Yeah, they're, they're far from a fluke. If anything, the Eastern Conference isn't as competitive as the Western Conference. I can agree with that. So I, but then again, the Eastern Conference has the Boston Celtics, who are arguably the best team in the NBA and the favorite to win it all. So... A fluke is a stretch, like I just said. They, they've gone through so much. Can you imagine this team fully loaded? It, it's like going into next season, if they just stay as they are, they're going to be unbelievable when they get their shooter back, when they get their guy Julius Randle back, when they have now a little bit more depth. Um, and there's a reason that Tibbs has been playing such a short rotation. Most coaches do that. We always talk about rotations shorten in the, in the playoffs, right? You only go six, seven, maybe eight deep. Mm. Tibbs, to his defense, he does play these guys a lot of minutes, which I don't think you can sustain, but he he has to. They're, they've been so injured. They've been so banged up. He really had no choice. Now, all of a sudden, he's getting some productive from, production from Alec Burks, which we'll get to. There's yeah. a, there's another guy, Shake Milton, that I think can also help them and give them some, some energy off the bench. But to call them a fluke when they're one game away from going to the Eastern Conference Finals doesn't make sense to me. I think the Eastern Conference they just is won by practice, I guess. Huh? I I mean the game that he the game that he was uh that he was reporting on they it's a thirty point win. What's the what's what's the fluke about that? I'm trying to get what, it. What's going on? By the way, I'll be a I'll be a fluke and I will walk my ass right to the Eastern <laughs> Conference Finals. So I wouldn't even take this personal if I was them. I I wouldn't either. Um, and it's weird. Look, they're, they're, you always have to have somebody that you hate on. It's odd for me to hear specific NBA players sort of hating because. As far as I knew, working for teams, the New York stop was always one of the stops circled on the schedule. People were excited to come to the city, and all of a sudden, it sounds like New York sucks, this sucks, pizza sucks, and I'm like, I, I don't know what happened. Um, it's, I do know it's it's like it's weird. It's playoffs. But it's playoffs, and you got to say something. We got to fill the air. You got to draw uh, a line. Da- yeah, you got to draw Dante, a line. Can, can we talk about Dante DiVincenzo? We got a lot of slow mo fu's last night, which I appreciated, uh, and they were all in the face. <laughs> of Miles Turner from one Dante DiVincenzo. He said that they were trying to act like tough guys, but that's not their identity. And I do love quotes like this, Chandler. They are fun for us to read and talk about. Uh, What do you make of this one from Dante towards Indiana? I mean, this is playoff basketball at its finest. Now, are the Pacers the toughest team that I've ever seen? No, <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them a soft team. I think when teams play, you know, offense, the clip that they play, and they're not really a defensive team like the Knicks, like the Timberwolves, you get tagged as soft because a lot of times defense means tough. So now listen, I don't think I, I don't think they're soft. I do think the, the Knicks play much, much harder. The Knicks are a tougher team. The Knicks can do it for 48 mm-hmm. minutes. They have guys like Devin Chinzo. They have guys like Josh Hart that just go, 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 go. Isaiah Hartenstein just goes offensive glass. They're gritty. They're gutsy. So that I, that's what I take this. I don't think he means like, like, like soft, soft, but I think sometimes that word soft, you don't want to get called that. You don't want to get tagged soft, especially by the team that's playing against you. So they, they should definitely use this as full uh, as fuel and going into game six at home. The Pacers have got to come out as the aggressive one. They have got to throw the first punch. They have got to set the tone because they know whether shots are going in or shots are missing, the Knicks are going to play hard for 48 minutes. So the Pacers have to match that intensity. Lou, soft is bad. I, I don't soft I don't think neither good. one of them are tough. Yeah. Wow. Neither one of their brands are neither one of their brands are tough. If if anything, if we're gonna keep this in the in the context of basketball, do you New York Knicks are a tougher basketball team than they are mm-hmm. simply because of how they play? You look at what they did on the offensive boards. That's just being tougher. That's just hard work last night. So you give Hardestine credit, you give Josh Hart credit for what they were able to do on the offensive end, 50-50 balls and all of that, playing hard. Yes, you give you give that you give the Knicks the edge on that. But when it comes down to pushing, shoving, and comeback, Dante, you out of your weight class with that one. Now maybe you were you were standing your ground 
I'm, I'm with that, but tough is neither one of these guys' brands, but we love it. It's, it's playoff basketball. Everybody is showing pride on both sides of trying to win a basketball game. Can't be mad at that. The Hardenstein part of it, too, like he came out after that last game, he sort of apologized to the fans, and you could see it last night when he came out strong, 12 offensive rebounds, ties a playoff record with the one and only Charles Oakley. So it, it was definitely an effort night. Um, and we can't skip the part, Shams, where – Tibbs has gone from, oh, my God, coach of the year, back to, oh, Tibbs being Tibbs, playing everybody too much. Everyone's hurt. This is all his fault. Then you get a win like last night, a game away from the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't know what to make of his status in New York. Here they love him. But on the outside looking in, what does it look like? Tom Thibodeau is one of the best coaches in the NBA, and he's going to be entering the final year of his contract next season. You're not going to let a coach – like Tom Thibodeau going to a lame duck year. And so that's why I'm told both sides will discuss a new deal in the offseason. The Knicks very much want to lock in Tom Thibodeau long term. If he were to ever become a coaching free agent, there's not a short list of, of teams uh, that would try to go get Tom Thibodeau. He's at about $7 million per season right now on his current deal. And we see where these coaching contracts are going. And so it's, it wouldn't surprise anyone if his next deal approaches eight figures. You look at his four seasons, 175 and 143 in the regular season, three playoff berths, one conference semifinals appearance. He's already had another conference semifinals appearance. They're one win away from their first conference finals since 2000. Just what Tom Thibodeau has done in his four seasons in New York has been impressive. Uh, and I think to an extent, both teams here are playing with house money. But for either to make it to the conference finals would be just a massive, uh, I think, moment for the franchise. Uh, that, that gets that far. And, and Shams, think about Tibbs' coaching staff to the development of all these guys. We're talking about career years for every single one of these players. Josh Hart, unbelievable. Mm. Dante DiVincenzo, he wasn't doing this in Golden State, right? Hartenstein wasn't having this type of role in, in his previous years in the league. Jalen Brunson was awesome in Dallas. They should have resigned him. They blew that, but he wasn't this superstar guy. So the, the infrastructure and the role and the system that Thibodeau, yes, are the minutes too much? Yes. are the, are the Can they sustain that? I don't think so. But at the end of the day, the, he has this team on the same page. He has everybody that has mastered their roles. And the most important thing in the NBA is he has these guys playing extremely hard every single night, which is going to put them in position to win games. So as much as people talk about the injuries that are happening in the, in the minutes, Tom Thibodeau has done an unbelievable job just figuring out this roster and making this team possibly go to the Eastern Conference Finals with all the adversity that they've faced, all the injuries. He's done a great job. So you have to credit him and his assistants for just the development of these guys that are having. Deuce McBride, never heard of this guy till this year. He's an absolute <laughs> hooper. Like, you know what I mean? Everybody on this roster is having a career year. And a lot of that has to go to the coaching staff. I'm glad you pointed that out, Chandler. And he did make adjustments last night. McBride started, precious off the bench. Don't tell me he's not flexible. That's flexibility. Uh, Rick Carlisle on the other side of things. And this is weird. Like, these two last two games in this series – depending on who you root for, are, are sort of snooze fest. They're embarrassing, right? Last night it happens to the Pacers. Rick Carlisle said, very embarrassing loss, Lou. How do you not agree with him? No, I, I agree. You know, this this is a, a very, very telling thing when, when you allow a guy to get 12 offensive rebounds. You know, that's just effort. That's one and more than the other basketball team. And you give up 12 of those, like three, four, should be a career night. But 12 on the offensive end, he just put his head down and said, I want to win this game better than y'all. And this is a big-time game. This is a big, deciding game. And so when it came down to it, the New York Knicks did everything that they had to do to win the effort plays. They got the 50-50 balls. They got the offensive rebounds. They were able to execute. They won, won the turnover game. All of the little detailed things that coaches love, the New York Knicks were able to do it. And all of the little things that coaches hate, the Indiana Pacers succeeded at doing that and getting, getting to the point where their coach called this loss an embarrassing one. You know, so I, I totally agree with him. It just wasn't there. The effort just wasn't there. You know, they got outplayed and, even uh, yeah. down to Tyrese Halliburton, like oh, just, yeah. just how he played. It, it didn't seem like he really it didn't seem like he wanted it. Miles Turner looked like he really wanted it. T.J. McConnell looked like he wanted it. Other than that, I think the other guys were trying to ease into this game. They wanted a passive. They wanted a pretty basketball game and they didn't get it. The New York Knicks were more gritty and more grimy. And this is a fair criticism of his basketball team to say this is an embarrassing loss and such a, a, a big deal of a game.
And I, I played for Rick in Dallas, and there's two type of film sessions for this guy. There's either one, okay, uh -oh. you put the effort in, this is great defense, better offense, there's, they'll show clips flying around. After a game like last night, I guarantee you he went around on that flight back to Indiana with an iPad showing each player how they got punked, how they got outworked, how they didn't box out, how they so he I guarantee you he had an actual, you know, aggressive film session with each player that he thought was contributing to this effort that was embarrassing. It's too far in this season. It's too tight, too too. The last thing you should be talking about right now as a coach, as a team, is effort. Like if shots make, shots miss, you're going to turn the ball over trying to be aggressive. But when you could get down to this point of the season, series on the line, on the road, the last thing you got to worry about is effort. And this seems like this was just an effort game where they didn't have energy. They didn't do all the little things. They didn't box out. They weren't the first on the floor. And Rick's going to go over that. And I expect him to be a lot better on game six in Indy. Yeah, effort at this point. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other game of the night felt like it started at midnight. Uh, T-Wolves and Nuggets. Denver takes the lead in that one. There he is. Jokic, obviously the big story last night. 40 points, 7 rebounds, 13 assists, 0 turnovers. Aaron Gordon had 18 points, 10 rebounds. Cat had 23. Um, look, there's been a lot of talk. We just we did it with Brunson and Ant. And Jokic, of course, is the MVP. I feel like Chandler last night, maybe that was a subtle reminder to all of us. He is the MVP. Uh, this was a masterpiece last night, Michelle. I have never seen, first of all, the discrepancy in the best offensive player, the best player in the world, we all can agree is Jokic, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that he did that to the best defensive player in the world, and he's doing it pretty much every game and just picking him apart. You can't guard him one-on-one. -on -one. He's so Mikhail meets Hakeem Olajuwon, but then he'll just body you like a shack, but then he'll take you out like Dirk <laughs> and crazy fadeaways. There's nothing this man can't oh, do in the basketball so court. Good. And last night, when he he had a different he had a different vibe to him he had a different feel this guy was so aggressive he was cutting hard he was setting screens hard he was diving into the basket i've never moved i've never seen him move so hard and play with such urgency than i did last night and he completely dominated this game zero turnovers with the amount of offense that plays through him this is just a beautiful performance when his team needed them the most they, they were writing him off. We even made a sweep, like sweep jokes down 0-2. Yeah. These, he has completely turned it on, has dominated, and led this team to three games in a row and probably going to be four games in a row and win this series because this man is the best player in the world, and there's no one even close. <laughs> Would you see, Lou? It's hard, I mean, it's hard to... Hey, listen. You know when we say a guy's in his bag... Jokic was in his Santa bag. He had gifts <laughs> for everybody. Gather around, I got gifts for each and every one of y'all. He made Rudy Gobert look like he wasn't even supposed to be in the defensive player of the year conversation. Mm. In, every, in every way you can imagine, he had left hooks, he had right hooks, he had up and unders, he had fadeaways, three-pointers, and ones, off the dribble. I'm passing the ball, I have a triple-double, no turnovers. It was incredible. It was a ma it was a master class. Every time that the Minnesota Timberwolves thought they were gonna make a run, Joker said, mm -mm, "I'm in full control of this game tonight. Not happening. Not happening. Not happening." This was just a this was just a masterful performance. He put this team on his back. He carried them in every way that he could. It was it was impressive. This is the most impressive game that I've ever seen him play. Every time that the wow. Minnesota Timberwolves made an adjustment to guard him, he adjusted to that, and he trumped them on every single level. Got to give him big-time credit. After that game, I feel like it's a closeout now. I feel like it's, I feel like it's done. Because if he comes with half of this effort the next game, it doesn't matter what the Minnesota Timberwolves do. This thing is done. Lou, think about what we're talking about. Like, think about how good is Jokic that he can just do that to the four-time defensive player of the year. <laughs> It's almost, it's, it's, he's so good, it's not even discrediting oh. Rudy Gobert because he was bodied him, right. he was there. He played solid defense. There's just no way to guard this cat one-on-one -on -one. and the discrepancy between Chandler, him. Chandler, I miss one. Insane. I miss one, Chandler. Oh. My bad, I miss one. He was even on the rim last night. 
That's what I was going to say. He's coming down. Sweet ass dunk. He was even even on the rim last night. Like, he gave them everything that they could imagine. If you ever think about playing against a top player and it puts some fear in your heart before the game, this was one of those games where you understand why. Like, he was total domination. Just think about that. Minnesota's like, ah, it's cool. We got the number one defense. We got Rudy Gobert, some player of the year. Still, neither of those are the right answers for Nikola Jokic because he is the (laughs) best player on the planet. He's the best offensive player on the planet. He's the smartest, best passing big of all time. And there's literally no answers for him. And when, like Lou just said, and when I said, when he plays with this sense of urgency and he's moving that hard, I have never seen him move and run that quick and a quick little screen and get out. Quick little, like he he was uh, he was on something else. He's gonna get drug tested today because he was next level. (laughs) last night. I would love that. And, and, by, by and the way, honestly, oh, go ahead. it didn't even matter who guarded him. It didn't matter. Yeah. So we can criticize Rudy Gobert all we want. We can, but Nas Reed got some of it. Cat got some of it. McDaniels got some of it. Uh, uh, my, my man, Slow Mo came off the bench. Kyle Anderson came off the bench and got some of it. It was even to the point Kyle Anderson got subbed in the game. They put him on Jokic and he looked at Rudy like, <laughs> Why am I guarding him? Like, you know, you're the defensive player of the year. Why what do you, am I guarding him? What do you do game six? Just on the catch, go get him? Like, no matter where he is? Like, has, don't even let him no, put he's it on too the floor. Good of, he's too good of a passer. He, 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 I, listen, he had that cover, too. 13 assists, no turnovers. Amazing. I dare you to come double me. Please do. Please do. And now Caldwell Pope is shooting lights out. We can't wait for y'all to trap. If I'm the Minnesota Timberwolves, I'm like, shit, I don't know. I, I really yeah. don't know. It's one of the best. The Minnesota Timberwolves are one of the best defensive teams this season of all time. They still have no answers for this guy. It's, it's yeah. unbelievable. And we've it's raved possible, about the Minnesota not. Timberwolves defense. We've raved about their defense. We love this team. Defensively, they looked like they were out of sorts, and it had nothing to do with them. Joker was playing that much better than everybody else on the court. Simple and plain. Well, Chandler, you think he might get drug tested. Obviously, the uh, the journalists after the game also were curious about the uh, the amazing moves. They asked them about it. I mean, I had an open, open lane and I just, you know, I'm a freak of nature. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> why not to show my athleticism? It's just, he's just my favorite. I don't care. He's <laughs> just a ridiculous person. Oh, he is a freak of nature, and it's in a different way across the board. Um, Shams, the big news last night, too. Look, I I don't know that it would have necessarily mattered when Jokic plays like that, but Mike Conley did miss this game, and it was announced before the start. Is he planning on missing more games? There is cautious optimism. He does play in game six, from what I'm told, but this is an injury where last night he he could barely really move that that leg, that foot. Uh, He did pregame warm-ups. He could barely jump on his shot. Um, he has Achilles soreness, and when you think about a player is, is, you know, that's up there in age and Mike Conley, uh, that's someone that is going to need to make sure he's 100%. If he can barely jump in warm-ups, that's not a great sign. Um, but you, you think about Anthony Edwards, his relationship with Anthony Edwards and how well they coexist. Last night, 5 of 15 mm-hmm. for Ant. Um, they, they're going to need him to be even more aggressive in Game 6, and hopefully for him he has his, his, his partner in the backcourt with him in game six on yeah, and and Shams having Mike Conley out that's like just that's like not having your pops like that, that's like he's he's just comforting it's not necessarily his production that's your old vet that's your that's your guy that gets everything everybody calmed down when Jokic does go on a run you have Mike Conley kind of getting the you know your offense set so the, as much as he's been great and consistent for them without him on the floor that's their floor general that's their leader and they played Alexander Walker last night and he started a point who actually had a very good game, but it's not the same having Mike Conley's presence. It's just way more comfortable having him on the floor. So that is a huge hole that the Timbers, that the Timberwolves had to face last night without him on the on the floor. Man, yeah, that the vibes in that one feel very shifted. But we shall see. Uh, you got to play the games. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Demar Derozan here on Run It Back. Woohoo! The Run It Back, Run It Up, Run It Back, Run It Up. He's here, 15-year vet, six-time All-Star, DeMar DeRozan joins the show and... 
great friend to Lou Will, which means, Damar, we need something. We need dirt. We need a story. He's a very cool cucumber, and he gives us nothing. What can you tell me? Oh, if he don't give you nothing, I'm definitely sure. I ain't going to give you nothing. <laughs> if he ain't give you approval, I can't either. <laughs> Well, it is, it, is it give. weird to see Beetle, him? I told you, it ain't nothing to Come give. On. I'm good. Yes, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's definitely weird to see. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it, but it's cool to see at the same time. You know what I mean? Even I even make fun of him being, you know, the coach of his daughter's team. You know what I mean? It's just, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a sight to see. You know what I mean? I love, I love to see it though, man. <laughs> All of his responsibilities. He's got a lot going on right now. I love um, it, man. Okay, Demar. Obviously, the season doesn't end uh, ideally with the play-in loss and all of that. But you, you know, you've been doing this. I want to know when the season ends for you. Is there a as a decompress period? Do you immediately go on a quick vacation, come back? Do you even watch the playoffs? Like, how do you handle the start of your off season? You know, it's crazy. Like when we lose, it's only a handful of people that can call me. I think Lou called me a couple of days after, asked me to come on the show. <laughs> He the only phone call I answered. I swear, it's only probably like seven people phone calls I answered. And Lou was one of them when he called me, I think, not too long after about doing the show or whatever. Um, but I kind of just I kind of just get away from the game a little bit, um, take some time to myself, and kind of get back in the zone of just being a father more more so than anything. Mm. But, um, yeah, I just get away from everything. I kind of don't watch the first couple games because I'd be, I be that pissed off not playing. Mm. Um but yeah, I just take time to myself. Have you? Uh, has any been any of these series been standing out to you, or do you root for players, teams? Or are you just watching? I mean, all of them been. It's been great. The competition level is is incredible to watch, man. Especially all these young guys. You know, you see a guy like Brunson putting up forty points a night. You see and Edwards coming out, you, you would think he was a 10 year vet with the swag he coming out uh, playing with, you know, just being a fan of the game, being kind of awesome to me just to watch every single series, you know, even OKC, those young guys competing every single night, man. It's just a cool thing to see when, you know, you get back in a fan perspective of, of things and, you know, just watch the game, you know, uh, every series been great. Except for whoever bought it. I got a. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Yep. Straight up. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> uh, Debo, I got a, I got a couple questions for you. I know you're going into uh, you're going into free agency this off season. What's the what's the vibes like in Chicago? Are you holding your cars close, trying to see how it play out, or is that somewhere you would like to return back to? It's definitely you know somewhere I like to return to. I think more so than anybody. You know, when the job ain't done with me, Lou. You know, no matter the how tough the the situation may look, I'm one of those guys that try to stick it through and try to make something out of nothing, you know, and, you know, um, the city is great. I love the city. The organization been great, you know, so it's definitely a place I, I, I would love to return to and just, you know, um, take care of unfinished business. And, you know, you know, we personal homies and we have these, we have a lot of conversations about um, life and the kids and the pressures of dealing with, dealing with everything. And you wrote a book, Above the Noise. Um, you do your, you do your, uh, do your show, uh, dinners with Demar, and you talk about mental health, and you talk about just the rigors of going through an NBA schedule, de- dealing with lifestyle, and having that balance of family. I just wanted to give you a, a, a platform to expand on um, the things that you've been trying to get out to people in your message. Man, I appreciate that, man. It's just you know been a journey, man. Like, um, like it's one of those things that it comes with time. That you know we go through so much as as athletes, um, as human, as men. Um, that we don't necessarily speak about, you know. Um, I just remember our time together, all the conversations we used to have, and you know, I know you, you talked. This one thing I could, I can mention. You talked about, you know, being a lot of times when you was going through, you was going through something. I remember you was ready to hang it up a few times, and you know, we had to have a conversation mm-hmm. and and talk you out of it. And next thing you know, you get two six man um, awards, and sometimes you need that, you know. Um, that voice that you could kind of lean on and talk to. So just me trying to open up and be that and, and give it inspiration and hope and light from a mental health standpoint that, you know, have such a stigma on it that make it seem like you, you weak or whatever it may be, just trying to break that stigma more than anything. So, you know, I've been through a lot. I made it out of Compton, California. So I feel like my story that I could tell could, could help so many people. So to me, it becomes bigger than basketball. That's awesome. 
Demar, you're from LA, like you said, from Compton. Played at USC. The Lakers are looking for a free agent this summer with your exact <laughs> skill set. I know growing up, uh, I know growing up in Orlando, if I ever had a chance to play on the Magic, I would have jumped on. Is that something that you, as a kid, like w- would die to do, playing for that purple and gold? Is that something that you would keep your, you know, your options open this summer? I mean. When I, when I was a kid, every, everybody know I'm a Kobe guy at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Always been a Kobe guy, been a Laker friend since day one. You know, um, you can't never say no about playing home, especially for playing, uh, you know, for a historic team like the Lakers. So, you know, time will tell. We'll see where the cars fall. Until then, you know, um, I'll see what happens. You know, I'm, I always want to be where I'm wanting. I know what I'm going to do from there. So we'll see how I play out. Also, I got a side. I got a side note, Demar. I played for Billy D in college too. And when I first went there, I thought he was the biggest asshole, bro. When I first got listen, there, I, listen. <laughs> you know how many stories Billy didn't told me about you, and it'd be, it's the funniest. It's the, yes. you know, he didn't. I didn't heard every story. Trust me. So whatever you say, Billy probably already uh, told me. This man was ruthless until I became. You yeah. know, I went in there as an arrogant little bastard. Is he, does yeah. he still carry that kind of attitude and that kind of energy? Or nah, now that- that's, that's what's crazy because the stories he tell me, even like a lot of older guys that play for him, the stories that I hear about Billy don't match up to who Billy is now. Uh-oh. You know what I mean? <laughs> is the coolest person he in the old, world. Like, I, yeah, you yeah, know like, when them coaches I, get old, they chill out. <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about Billy's so cool, man. Like, I I love I love Billy, man. He come in there chewing his gum, and, and he just... Ooh, chews it hard. Yeah, true. he be chewing the hell out of some gum, but it's like, <laughs> Billy cool, man. But trust me, I hear all those I hear all those stories, man. Man. <laughs> By the way, did you guys notice Chandler said he was an arrogant little ass? Like, as if that was the past? Yeah, well played, see, Chandler. Everyone, well, everyone, everyone grows up. Everyone he, grows told me he, up. Sent you home. he told me he sent you home or something like... Jamar, no. this man t- pulled me into his office one time and called my parents, put it on speakerphone, called the coach of Arizona State and said, hey, man, I need you to take Chandler Parsons. He's transferring. He's a, like, he's a <laughs> I'm like, damn. Oh, Didn't even, no warning, what? nothing. That's yeah, awesome. He, told him. <laughs> he was ruthless. He can't, bro. listen, <laughs> he can't do that now in that, he can't do that now with that no, portal. No, he can't do it Anybody now. else he no. tried like that, they out of there. Oh, yeah? Out of here. Oh, <laughs> can't do good. it now, bro. Damn. Demar, you grew up a Kobe fan. I know you've carried his legacy uh, through his shoes as well. And that relationship really evolved as your career went on as well. What kind of impact did Kobe have on you growing up and now still to this day? Um, I mean, he, he gave me a different type of mental edge and approach to, to the game, um, to preparation, you know, especially in the off season. You know, a lot of my, um, you know, kinks and everything that I got my work ethic I got from Kobe, you know, getting up at four, working out in the morning, you know, pushing myself, trying to, you know, find different ways to, you know, channel your your, your mental edge. You know, I, I see Chandler in the gym every day when I'm in there boxing, you know what I mean? It's like, so I, I'm trying something every, different, you know, every year to just have that mental edge, you know, on players going, in, going into the off season. And that's one thing I learned from Kobe, just trying something, knew all the time, pushing yourself. So I, I like the unwritten rules about the shoes. Obviously, you were the Kobe's. We, we had uh, Jordan McLaughlin on talking about he wears the Kyrie's, but when he plays Kyrie, God, no, you cannot wear those shoes. So when you played Kobe, did you keep them on or did you switch for those games? I kept them on. I told I told the story before. It was one game where I didn't keep them on, like, because I remember I played against Vince, and Vince was like, you wear Kobe's when you play against Kobe? So I took offense <laughs> to it, like, Nah, I ain't gonna do it next time. So next time I played Kobe, I wore some Jordans. I wore some Jordans tens. As soon as I walked on the floor, Kobe cussed the hell out of me, right, mm-hmm. right, like or tip tip off. And I, uh, <laughs> ever since then, I, I stayed with my Kobe's on. I never, I never wore Jordans again. Oh no, man, <laughs> keen was, eye. Keen, was do you guys? I, and this goes for everyone. Do you remember the shoes you have on, like in in peak moments or milestone moments? Like you drop fifty. Do you remember what you had on tomorrow? Specific? Nah, because I, I changed I change my shoes a lot at halftime. Like, oh. nah, I, saw, I, don't, I don't remember. I wouldn't remember. 
They start okay, running together. Enough. All them games, they start running together after a while. I promise yeah, you. Yeah, after, Especially when you're yeah. done. Wait till you, listen, wait till you're officially done and somebody asks you something to reminisce on. You're going to be like, uh. <laughs> yeah. They all run together. Every all single run one. together. Jamar, year 15 this past year, you averaged 24 points a game and you play 79 games, which is bonkers. Yeah. So there's no load management with you. Uh, your, yeah. How's your body stay? Well, you mentioned that I see you in the gym boxing. Is that that's more of an off-season workout to stay in shape? But how have you been able to stay so healthy and in shape? You know, at this point of your career, 15 years is, is nuts. Bro, I, I don't do anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm in, with my kids. Just who? I'm sleep. I'm working out. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't do nothing. You know what I mean? So it gives me plenty of time to either recover or try new things for recovery, take care of my body, try to eat the, try to eat the right way. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult just to be disciplined, you know what I mean? But I think for me, I just want to, you know, I try to hold it down for the older guys more so than anything and, and just show that, you know, this age thing is not a, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a thing. I think I let them the lead in minutes this year, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. um, just, just trying to prove that, you know, once you take care of yourself, you can play as long as you want at a high level as much as you want, you know. So that's another just stigma I be trying to break. You know, I, I even text CP throughout the season and tell him, like, and we got to hold it down for the older guys. Even though I'm not – I don't think I'm that old, especially those guys, you know. Um, but just trying to hold it down more so than anything. I, I think from my standpoint, having right. friends like Lou that I play with that's retired, you know what I mean, it's, it's, it gives me the motivation to where it's like I'm not ready to do the talk show yet. I mean, 15 oh, years. Yeah. It's coming. Is, it's coming. Is, 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 is there like a goal? Like, do you want to get to 20 years? Like, is there like, do you want to play for three? Do you even think about that yet? Or is this just like take one season at a time, day by day, and just hopefully you stay healthy? To be honest with you, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, that's a great question. I don't want to play 20 years. I'll be honest. Like, I, I, yeah. I don't. I just, I just, I don't. You know what I mean? Just for the standpoint of like, you know, I miss my kids, you know. I kind of, I kind of love being normal at times, you know. Uh, Twenty years is a lot, you know. It's just, and I care too much for the game. I, I would never want to cheat the game, you know. And I think by the time I get to year twenty, you know, I'm uh, you know, I, I, nah, nah, I just, I'm just <laughs> so like, no, not twenty. Okay, a tw- five more years is a lot. Doesn't seem like a lot saying it, but it does feel uh, like a lot. It's a lot, you, you know. It's, it's a like, lot. Um, it's a time, especially when you get close to it. Yeah, yes, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, back in January, you had a tweet out. Somebody's going to score 100 before the season's over. That happened to yeah. be the day that Luca had the 73 and Booker dropped the 62. Um, yeah. Just take a guess. If somebody's going to do it, who's it going to be? Got to be somebody who can get to the free throw line at a high level. Somebody who shoot a lot of threes. Um uh, hmm. Say a healthy NB can I like, get it. I like these two though. Hmm. Yes. I think I, ain't rolling. I like. I yeah. think. I think Luca do it because Joel won't shoot enough threes to get there. True. Yeah, Luca can see him. those nights where he knocks down 12, 10, 12, 10 threes. He has twenty plus free throws. I can see Luca getting it. No, that's yeah, see Luka. If that happens, I, 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 I like, I like Luca getting it. Somebody, somebody gonna get close to it. I'm telling you the Shit, way it got. It gotta I, be somebody on the Knicks as many minutes as they play. Shit. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, like, what's gonna just, happen first? A hundred point game or a let's throw Bronson in there or a quadruple double from Wimby. Oh, uh, Wimby, Wimby. <laughs> big money, Wimby sure. big money. Wait, go. I have sure. I, the whole. The 100 point thing is big because Lou, we did not know uh, when we started working together that he's a conspiracy theorist. He does not believe yeah. in the Wilt Chamberlain 100 point game. So, uh, we, he know do that. you? He, he <laughs> knows I don't believe in that. Show us the tape. He know that. <laughs> That's why Lou, my guy. He knows. He, know, <laughs> he know it's two, it's two Wilt stats I, I, I want to I take to the competition committee and. and, mm-hmm. and we got we to gotta audit the files. There's two stats he got in his life that I, I want some proof of. What's the and other one? Is basc- is basketball, yeah. One's basketball related and one's not basketball oh, related. It's, one. it's two stats. What could it be? Hey, listen. Uh, listen, Wilt didn't get close 
to 25,000 nothing outside of points <laughs> in rebounds. <laughs> and that's all. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Yeah, Are you the only? Is he the only one that whole, thinks it? That's a whole other. No, no, that's a whole other show. The, I think no, the no, hundred points, I'm, Chandler. I'm, the, not the women. I'm, the I'm hundred points. points. <laughs> maybe the women. The women. He's gassing so hard. No way. <laughs> yeah. Could be a debate. Yeah, yeah. Demar's not touching it. That's fair. I wouldn't. This is a weird conversation. I ain't about yeah. to have me get attacked on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. You, you stay out of it. Me and Chandler go viral enough. I go viral by being with Chandler. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Demar, you're, you're arguably the best mid-range shooter in the NBA. Um, obviously, there's a lot of young players now that shoot a lot of threes. But is there someone you see in the game today that you feel like you know what this guy's also the master of the mid-range? Young guy. Um, I mean, I see a glimpse in it. You know what I mean? I think, you know, even last night I seen Ant, Ant you know. Paul faked the three, took one dribble in, shot a bank shot, mid-range. You know, you, you you don't see many guys, you know, you kind of see the pump fake sidestep for a three. So when I see little things like like that in guys' game, it, it just shows that, you know, the mid-range is not necessarily dead. You know, it just, uh, it's just so, it's so high frequency of three shot that guys, when they do shoot mid-range, kind of get overlooked. But it's a lot of young guys, like you, even JB, even Br Brunson, you know, the way he, he played in the mid-range. Yeah, SGA mm. is incredible in the mid-range, you know? And, and when you see a lot of those young guys, it, it's just a reminder that, you know, the mid-range mid isn't dead. You know, it's just a narrative that's so easy to get caught up in because you see so many threes shot, but the pace of the game is at such a high level that you don't see it so often that guys just, you know, get into the mid-range shots. But definitely those young guys, Shea, uh, Brunson, um, JT, JT playing, it's incredible in the mid-range. Um, so seeing those guys, you know, it's, it's definitely fun to watch. Shit, SGA beat the Mavs the other night with just mid-range alone. Yes. Mid-range, get into a spot. Get into a spot. You can't touch Body him. Get into a spot. Pump fake. Uh, just, it's incredible to watch, you know? Yes, sir. D, I know, um, you know, we started fatherhood as, as girl dads. And, and last yeah. year, you took the girls out to the, uh, to the WNBA All-Star game. And JJ is getting in the hoop. I know your girls is starting to pick that ball up. What's that? What's that feeling like to be able to take them to go experience WNBA events and they can see some of the things that they can look forward to and how the game is growing? Man, it's it's, it's incredible just to see um, their eyes light up. You know, because they really don't care about dad too much. So when they see someone, <laughs> another girl playing, it's it's like their eyes light oh, up. Oh, so hold on. Hold up, Debo. So you you going you going through you going through the same thing I'm going through. So like, I'm only cool when it benefits them. Other than that, yeah. I'm the lamest guy they could ever they could ever meet. But when I can yeah. go when I can do something for them, I'm the cool parent. Oh, uh, for sure. You going like, through I, that? Yes. I, <laughs> the other day, I um took the girls to escape rooms for for Dr. Birthday, and you know I just felt like an outcast being with the girls. You know what I mean? It's like. It's like, Yara calling me like, come on, bro. Like, I said, what? She said, no, come on, daddy. We got to go in here. I said, oh, I'm dad now. And y'all want me to go in here. Wow. But, you know what I mean? Def definitely going through it, though. Oh, that's cute. By the way, speaking of your daughter, I think NBA fans got a fun introduction uh, to her yeah. distraction techniques last yeah. season. Did she enjoy that run? Of what? massive popularity. <laughs> to this day, she it's been places to this day I've been, whether I, she's with me or I'm by myself, and people just say, I, I love your daughter. Like she's she's incredible. Like you couldn't tell oh. her nothing when that first happened. You couldn't tell her nothing. Like it's it, and, and that's a cool moment that I'm, oh, yeah, I'm it, it's a cool moment that I could forever share with her with that because you know it, it mean it, it meant so much to her. You know, what I mean it changed like her confidence, her, her everything, you know, it just, it just showed a different light of her. So that was cool just to witness and have that moment with her because I said no about five, six times about her coming <laughs> to the game because I didn't want to miss her to miss school. So, um, uh -oh. it, it, it was, it was cool for her to, you know, have that moment. Miss school. Yeah. Oh, school schmool. I shouldn't need that. Uh, okay. We don't need to debate. I think you're the perfect person to ask this of, um, and Chandler is obsessed with this talk. 
topic, of course, is basketball players to the NFL, NFL players to the NBA. Do you have thought on the real the reality of any of that being possible? Y'all gonna have the NFL people tagging me now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, I they think. they upset. So we might as well yeah, jump down. Do they upset. Oh my god, they, they upset. Um, <laughs> I had this when when the debate first came out. I had. Uh, me and Alex Russo always talk about di- different topics. So I sent in him because I think, you know, Alex Russo is a player I could see playing in the NFL. So we oh. had a look back and forth. Like, you know, he was like, no chance. We got 30 players in the lead. I said, man, I can name about 10 right now that could play in the mm-hmm. NFL. What you mean? So we started going back and forth. Then, you know, he agreed with me. Then over the next couple of days, I started seeing everybody else, you know, comment and everything. Um, mm-hmm. I think basketball players could almost do anything if you give us two to three months to prepare for it. Okay. Um, I ju- I'm just a firm believer in that. Like, give us two or three months, we can do anything Ooh. possible. Eight. You know, so um, I think Eight. we have about tw- 20 people in our league that can play in the NFL. 20? Okay. This Look, is, I'm going right. to make this. Beto, I gotta, I'm going <laughs> to make this point. I'm going to make it real quick, right? Mm. I personally know guys who dedicated their lives to basketball all the way up until their senior year realized, you know what? This is not going to work out. I'm going to go out for the football team. And they've made handsome livings in the NFL. You've never heard of a football player playing football all the way up to high school and saying, you know what? I'm going to go hoop and have an opportunity. That's all I'm going to say. That should tell you everything you need to know about the two things. I respect NFL, I respect NBA, but when it comes to somebody being able to translate over to the other sport, I think it's more likely for an NBA player to translate to a football player than vice versa. Oh, simply, just simply, simply skill, simply skill set. I know DeMar DeRozan can run a route and be a nasty wide receiver. I don't think Odell Beckham could be a starting shooting guard and hit a step back 30 footer. I just, I, he can't, it's a different skill. It's, it's, it's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and there's no not to no NFL player. You know what I mean? It's just like, and granted, it's, it's no not. I think so many people take it like it's a negative thing. Of you course. You know what I mean? I'd be the first to tell you, if I was a quarterback right now in the NFL and I seen Aaron Donald coming at me, I'm going to just lay down. Like, I, I oh, know. God. Y'all, 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 you know what I mean? Like, I'm, 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 I'm going to be see, that that's guy. The thing, Debo. But, but the see, that's down. the thing. There is a, <laughs> you might not be able to be the quarterback, but there is a right. position you can play. So people For like, sure. try tackling this person. I'm like, well, I'll just play offense. We'll try right. throwing. Yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just go play quarterback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> you know it's, playing in the NBA, being a basketball player is a different type of skill set that you have to have that's, that I just well, what don't about think. the duos? Like, what about like a Charlie Ward or like a Nate Robinson? Like, there have been dudes who've done both. But yeah, for sure. I don't know how how high a level you guys are considering either one of those. Oh, I'm not going to get you in trouble. Okay, fine. One more question. I am obviously the diss track expert on this panel. Um, very much up on all things Drake Kendrick, as one is. But you were actually name drop in Kendrick. So he's talking about how Toronto didn't deserve you. First of all, what is it like to be dropped in the middle of that particular back and forth? Uh, and did you get a heads up? I try to stay out of everything <laughs> because both of them, you know, both of them are my friends. Um, I'm just leaving it at, you know, yeah. of California. Um, it's kind you know, of awesome. Um, smart you man. Know, it's, smart, it's, smart it's, man. It's, I mean, at the end of the day, I think to see two of the biggest it's all stars competition. It's competition. Yes, yes, yes. Go yes. at it. You know, at this high level, I think we've never seen nothing like this. Um, so I think as far as like the fans won, because I think people been begging for this for for the longest one in one in, you know, two of the biggest stars to go at it, you know, and, and not try to, you know, read between the lines of sneak disses or whatever. It's like you got you got what you wanted. Fans, you got what you wanted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, don't complain now. You got two of the they biggest gave stars. Us an album worth of music. Yeah. Like so. Um, in two days, three days. In two days. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We, we, the fans won, you know, at the end of the day, the fans won, you know, um, no harm, no foul. And then it was all, it, it was all kept on, you know, on record, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of just seeing two greats doing, doing what they do best. 
It was awesome. Uh, Damar, this has been a pleasure. We appreciate the time so very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the off season. Thank you. Thank you. We'll appreciate, be back. Appreciate it, bro. Run it yep. over, run it back, yeah. run it over, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it over, run it back, run it over. Be a part of the playoffs like never before with Bet It Get It live right now on FanDuel. All you have to do is build a same game parlay for tonight's NBA action. Share it in the replies to the official contest post over on X. If your SGP is chosen, it'll be featured in the FanDuel Sportsbook app for all your friends to see. Plus, FanDuel will also hook you up with $100 in bonus bets. Entries close later today at 3 Eastern. Don't miss out. For more info, just look for Bet It Get It in the FanDuel Sportsbook app. I said X. I always say Twitter. Ew. All right. Uh, that was fun, DeMar DeRozan on, you guys. Lou, we got to get this Wilt Chamberlain documentary produced by you uh, going. <laughs> no, you're not going to have all the old heads mad at me. I just, <laughs> I, I, I just, I have opinions, and if people ask me about them, I'm going to share. <laughs> what, if they, what if they all have these secret ideas, too, and they've just been afraid to say them out loud? That could be yeah, the I'll case. I'll do it with you. I'll do well, it with you. I ain't buying it either. Look, Wilt said it. Nobody fact-checked it. Simple as that. I like the idea of doing this. And by the way, we have Blake Griffin on the show tomorrow, Chandler. Is that real? That's real. He will be tomorrow morning, right before we head to Cabo for the weekend for the member guest. I should have known. I should have known uh, there was a there's some sort of ending to that. <laughs> Are y'all going together? <laughs> nah, I tried to, but no, nah, he's he's there's no slumber Two. party. All right, Blake Griffin, tomorrow. Enjoy the games tonight. See y'all. Run it up, run it back, 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 run it up.